Well, good morning to you all. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you guys today. My name is Brandon Delage. I am on staff, as Francois noted, out in Gilbert uh, in our Students and Young Adult Ministries, uh, which basically just means I'm the crazy uncle out there, um, maybe with a dash of Cousin Eddie, but uh, really excited to be with you guys opening God's Word. If you could turn to Ephesians chapter six, if you don't know where Ephesians is in your Bible, it'll be on the screen. It'll also, there's a table of contents at the front of the Bible that'll help you find it. Um, I am... Uh, <laughs> Sean, Sean is making sure I don't skip past this. I uh, have closed my tenure actually as a student director in, in student ministry because uh, August 1st, I'm moving into the Vintage Mission Training Center where God has uh, so graciously allowed and appointed me to go bring the gospel to Tempe. Yeah, I'm gonna go plant a church near Arizona State University uh, where I believe God is gonna be doing incredible, miraculous things like he has in this church. Uh, we just need a new gospel outpost there. I can tell you this much, there's no shortage of good churches in Tempe. Uh, there's 60,000 college kids there who need uh, the good news of Jesus and I am excited to go be trained up for that this fall and the next year sometime I'll be heading to Tempe with a bunch of people who are bold enough and brave enough and Stupid enough to follow me. <laughs> but I am, I'm so excited to bring you God's word today. One more quick thing that I wanna note though before we get to that. Uh, I am so thankful for your pastor, Pastor Seth. Uh, he's away right now getting recharged and refreshed on sabbatical. Uh, but I don't know if you know this in the Bible, he, but he reminds me of one of my favorite characters, Barnabas. And Barnabas has two nicknames in the Bible. One is Zeus because he's big and burly. And when people look at him, they're like, hey, that dude, he's like Zeus, the Greek God. And then also, uh, Barnabas has another nickname and it's the son of encouragement. And if I could just encapsulate your pastor in three words, it's son of encouragement. Every time I'm around him, he is quick to uplift with a word and he puts courage into me to keep going, to keep pursuing Jesus. And I know he does the same for you. So I'm hopeful that as he's away, that God would be encouraging him because I know we're the beneficiaries of the ways God has gifted Seth again and again and again. Well, one thing I haven't noted yet, but I wanna tell you about myself is that I am a fiercely competitive person. And when I'm fiercely competitive, I'm also irrationally confident. Like I'm the kind of person who thinks he could take on uh, a major league baseball pitcher if you gave me enough time in the cage. Uh, but one thing I can't stand inside of competitions is when I play scared. Now, just a couple weeks back, I was out in California with some friends and uh, was blessed with the opportunity to play a world-renowned golf course named Torrey Pines. Now that means nothing to you if you're not a golfer, but if you're a golfer and you're here today, especially if you're a father, happy Father's Day, by the way. We're so glad that you're here and not on the golf course on Father's Day. Thanks for being here, worshiping Jesus with us. We're so pumped. Uh, but anyways, back to my awesome story. Um, I'm on the golf course, right? And I'm on the green. And these, it's the first time I've hit the green. I have a chance at a birdie putt, which is a really good score in golf. And I watch, and like any honorable golfer would, I made sure those two guys went first because I had the birdie putt, right? So I made sure they go, and first guy sails it way past the hole. Second guy sails it way past the hole. And now I'm in my head. Now I'm like, oh no, I'm, I can't go past the hole because then I'm looking at a bogey. I don't want a bogey, I want a birdie. So what do I do? I, I stand over the putt, and you know the feeling if you've been mini golfing at any point in your life. You know this feeling. It's like, don't go that way, don't go this way, don't hit it too hard, don't hit it too soft, hit it just right. And so I'm all over my head, all over my head, and I tap it, and it goes like two feet in front of me. I mean, just a pathetic excuse for a putt. I, I was so mad because I didn't even give it a chance. I was overthinking it, I was playing hesitant, I was playing scared. I'm sure if you were looking at me, my knees were probably shaking, I was so nervous. And I was frustrated. And here's, here's the problem with that. You see, it's one thing to leave a putt short. Like I'll most likely probably forget about that, I hope, at some point in my life. But it's another altogether to come up short on our mission for Jesus. To play scared, to be timid, to be hesitant, to be fearful. And I'm afraid that we're, afraid on the mission, we're timid on mission because we're afraid of making a mistake while on the mission. We overthink what we have to do, what we have to say, and we get up all in our head. And what happens is, is it leads us to inaction. It paralyzes us. We play not to lose instead of playing to win. So here's my question for you today. What, what's the difference then between being timid on mission and being bold on mission? 
between being weak and being strong. Because if we're going to get strong, if we're going to be strong, if we're going to stand strong, then we have to deepen our affections for Jesus. We have to demonstrate a more obvious allegiance to him and live out our gospel application. If we're gonna grow our muscles for mission, then we have to be a people who are bold on mission. And what we're gonna see in the Bible in Ephesians chapter six today is that for us to get strong and be strong and stand strong on mission, we have to be men and women of boldness. Every single Christian, not the tenured, not the naturally brazen, everyone, all of us. And here's why, jot this down. To get strong spiritually, we must be bold missionally. That's our big idea, our sermon in a sense. What's my sermon about? It's about this. To get strong spiritually, we must be bold missionally. We can't shrink back. We can't be paralyzed by our fear anymore, not trapped by our insecurity, not leave our lives short of the gospel. We must be bold on mission. Now, just to define the terms a little bit, here's what I mean by timid on mission and bold on mission. Being timid on mission is this. It's fear that holds you back from action. It's fear that holds you back, that traps you from taking action. Boldness is this. It's spiritual courage in the face of risk. When I'm saying to be bold missionally, I'm saying you need spiritual courage in the face of risk. Now, I'm not just making this up. It came from God's word. So why don't you join me in Ephesians chapter six, verse 19, where it says this. And also for me, he's saying, hey, pray for me also that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. These are God's words for us this morning. I'm praying that you don't just hear them, but God grips your heart with them and that he changes your life as a result. So if we're gonna get strong spiritually, if we're gonna be bold missionally, I wanna give you three fuels for missional boldness. We're gonna do it like this. To be bold missionally, first, we request God's words. We request God's words. Look back at your Bible with me. Verse 19, and also for me. Now he's just linking to verse 18, praying at all times. He's saying, hey, pray also for me. For what? For boldness. Now, when I read that, I get, I get really encouraged. Why? Because a, the apostle Paul is a spiritual monster. Like this dude takes whippings. He takes imprisonments. He takes like literally dying to the point where like everybody thought he was dead. They left him for dead after they stoned him. And he's like, no, I, I, joke's on you, I'm still here. That's this guy. And he's saying, hey, guess what? I need boldness. I need it. And that just encourages me because If Paul's praying for boldness, then I don't feel so bad asking for it myself. He's writing this very letter that we're reading from prison for sharing his faith. And he's got the boldness to ask God and ask his friends to pray for him for the very thing that got him in prison to begin with, again. He wants to be bold missionally. It wasn't something that he was necessarily born with. It wasn't something that was necessarily a personality trait of Paul's. He's saying, hey, I need God's words, otherwise I won't be bold. Pray for God's words for me. Now, in a superficial sense, boldness is kind of like hating football in the South or being an Android user in an iPhone world, right? It's like, it's, it's zigging when everybody else is zagging, okay? It's, it's the idea that you're like, hey, this is gonna put me at risk. People might not like me. They might think less of me as a result, but I'm, I'm gonna do this because I believe in this. That's Paul right here. Spiritual courage in the face of risk. He's being bold on mission. And he's he's not just like starting with this idea. Look back, if you would, actually, at verse 10 of the same chapter. It's linked right there to verse 10, where he says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. That's Paul's original encouragement in this whole section of the scriptures that we're reading is that we would be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. 
that he'll next unpack like all the armor of God as we're on mission in the middle of spiritual warfare. And as he concludes that, he's like, hey, 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 hey. Yes, we've got the armor. Yes, we've got the gospel. Yes, we're gonna be strong in the Lord. How can we be strong? Right there, verse 19. Pray for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth. Now, Paul isn't asking for words because he wants to be brash with his words. He's not asking for words because he doesn't know God's words. Paul writes Bible, dude is smart. He's asking for God's words because he wants to be clear. That if he's gonna appear before a Roman governor, he wants to be clear with what the gospel is. If he's gonna appear before somebody in Ephesus, he wants to be clear with the gospel. He wants God's words because he knows Romans chapter 10. He wrote it, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by what? The word of God. He's requesting God's words because he believes God's words hold the key to heaven and hell. They actually unlock for us God's power activating in people's hearts. It's God's words. And we will remain timid on mission so long as we think we need to rely on our own words. You'll stay stuck in fear. If you think that it relies on you, I remember not so long ago, I got the opportunity to preach in Gilbert for the first time. And if you're unfamiliar with our Gilbert congregation, it's a fairly large church. And uh, it was just a rare opportunity. I felt so encouraged and honored with the opportunity. And I, at this point, I've been in ministry for 10, 10 years. I should be confident getting to the pulpit, but I'm, it's Saturday, we're getting ready for the service. And here's where my head is, a nervous wreck. I'm not one who gets anxious naturally, but I'm in full blown like panic. And I'm just wrestling again, like, is it good enough? Is it good enough? Is it right enough? Did I say it right? Do I need to tweak this? Like, why, why was I feeling so much pressure? It's because I was relying on me. And Pastor Sean, your pastor here in the front row, he grabbed me. He just saw me kind of not being myself. He said, what's wrong? I said, I'm just really worked up right now. And he said, just go preach the word, bro. And when I realized in that moment that my confidence was in me, I had every reason to be terrified. But when I stepped back for a moment and looked up to the Lord through his words, guess what I saw? I actually was boldened by his words because God's words were what I needed and it's what the people needed. And God gives the words and it takes all the burden away. Boldness is born where your reliance on your words dies. And we request God's words because they give us the courage we need because he's the one who did it. So in case you remain unconvinced, let me give you three more reasons why you should request God's words on mission. First, it's because they're encouraging, so don't be scared. They're encouraging, don't be scared. I got this from Joshua chapter one, verse eight. Now I didn't misspeak there. You might've heard of Joshua 1, 9, where the Lord says, be strong and courageous. You've heard that? But look at verse eight, or here verse eight. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then, then you'll make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Why does Joshua have reason to be strong and courageous? Why does he not need to be scared? Why is God putting courage into him, literally encouraging him? It's when he gives him God's words. That God's words are right there on the tip of the tongue and that's all he needs to be bold and confident on the mission. So why should we request God's words? They're encouraging, so don't be scared. But second, they're satisfying, so don't look elsewhere. Peter, when talking to Jesus in John chapter six, says this in verse 68. Simon Peter answered Jesus and he's like, hey, Lord, to whom else shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. It's you who's got the words. Who else am I gonna listen to? Not Rogan, not some other podcast, not some other book. Where else am I gonna go? I'm going to this book because you have the words of eternal life and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. They're satisfying like any other, no other word is. They're the only words that can get to places that you and I can never get to with our words. They're the same words that spoke and all this came into being. It's that powerful. 
And when you place your confidence, when you place your boldness in God's words, guess what happens? You're emboldened for the mission. Third, another reason why you should request God's words is they're powerful, so don't be insecure. They're powerful words. Don't be insecure. Exodus chapter four, verses 10 through 12. Exodus 4, 10 through 12. But Moses said to the Lord, oh my Lord, I am not eloquent either in the past or since you've spoken to your servant, but here's what I am. I'm slow of speech and of tongue. Then the Lord said to Moses, who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. God's words are powerful like any other. And Moses doesn't take that counsel to heart. He actually struggles to the point where God appoints another messenger. But hear me, that same truth is for you. That God is with your mouth. And so we request God's words, why? Because they're powerful like any other. The shift from timid to bold missionally and weak to strong spiritually will be when we pray nonstop for words. Like it should be ongoing dialogue between you and God throughout the day. Hey God, I need words because I have this tough conversation with my sister. Hey God, I need words because I'm meeting with this small group member at, over at the coffee shop. Hey God, I need words because I'm talking to my kid tonight and I just have a feeling, Lord, it's gonna be a tough conversation. I just need words. Stop feeling the pressure of having to come up with more words and release yourself of the burden by bowing to the book. God wants to help you. And to be strong, to get strong, to be bold missionally, we have to request God's words. That's the first thing. Second, I want you to see it in the text. To be bold missionally, we proclaim God's message. We proclaim God's message. Where am I getting that? Right there in the text. What does it say? In opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. Now, I just wanna unpack that for a moment. The mystery of the gospel, it's not a secret. It's not like an episode of Scooby-Doo where you're looking at red herrings all the time and you're like, hey, what's going on here? It's not what this is. Can you tell I'm a dad of four kids, by the way? Scooby-Doo reference. I don't even think that's a relevant thing anymore. Um, anyways, what's the mystery? The mystery is this. It's the good news that God has come not just to save the Jews, but to save Gentile and the whole world. That's the mystery of the gospel that Paul's referring to here. It was an unknown thing then, but we know it now. And the church is one in Christ. We are unified in Christ. The walls that make hostility between us and other cultures, guess what? They're torn down by Jesus. It's no longer Jew and Gentile. And it crushes any notion that the kingdom of God is exclusive to any kind of people for all who would call upon the name of Jesus. And at this time and place, that blows people's minds, but this is not a new thing. God has always been a missionary God. Do you know this about God? He's mission-minded, and it's been that way all the time. In fact, jot this down, Genesis chapter 12. It's where God intersects with Abraham, and he says, hey, I wanna bless you, and I'm gonna curse those who curse you, but in you, and in your seed, guess what? All the nations of the world will be blessed. He's not just concerned about Abraham's offspring. He's concerned with the whole world even then in Genesis chapter 12. Scripture is clear from beginning to end. God's mission is to save all people from the penalty and power of sin. And so Genesis, what's revealed to us in Genesis chapter 12 continues. 1 Samuel 16, where the message of the gospel continues through David. 1 Samuel 16, it moves forward with him. It also continues with Jesus arriving in the gospels and saying, hey, the kingdom of heaven is here, repent. It's the message that the apostles died, martyrs' deaths believing. It's the message that's penned on the pages of the scriptures for us to read. And it's this, that the kingdom of heaven is here and so is the king. And friends, that's not good advice. That's good news. That's an announcement. The king is here. 
And the thing about news is it's meant to be shared. It's meant to be proclaimed. So what is the gospel? It's what God has done in Christ to save us. That's the good news. News isn't something that you are. It isn't something you do. It's something you proclaim. And here's the message we proclaim. It's that the world isn't filled with bad people and good people, with Jew and with Gentile, with Arizonans and Californians. It's, it's, it's not that. It's actually the message of the Bible is this, that the world is filled rather with dead people and alive people. And what God has done in Christ to save the dead is he has lived a perfectly righteous life. Jesus has fulfilling God's law perfectly and holy for us. For God has done what sin and the law could not do. It has saved us. And Jesus dies as a worthy substitute in our place on the cross. God crushes Jesus when he could have crushed us instead. We should have been crushed for our iniquities. We should have been crushed for our iniquities. But God the Father crushed Jesus for us instead as a worthy payment for our sins, as a ransom for our freedom from sin. So Jesus dies. He dies a horrible death, crucified, nails driven into his hands, a crown of thorns placed upon his head, whipped dozens of times, bleeding and crying and hurting for every person who would ever call upon his name to be saved. And so he dies. It was the day God died. But three days later, he didn't stay dead. He rose again victorious over sin and death forever. And that is news to be proclaimed. That all who are dead now can be made alive because of what Jesus has done, what God has done through Jesus so that we can be saved. We aren't the good news. We have the good news and we share it on the mission. But you know why that gets you strong spiritually? Why it builds boldness in you for the mission? Because hear this, hear this. Your boldness on mission at the horizontal level with people, it'll be in direct proportion to the measure with which you believe the vertical mission of God has come to save you. I'll say that again. You will only be so bold on mission toward people that you can see so much as you believe in the vertical mission of what God has done to save you. To the measure you believe that, that is what will embolden you in your faith. When you recognize what God has done to save you, it blows your mind. If you think that it's a small thing for God to overcome your unbelief and to carry the message of the gospel, from person to person, from country to country, so that it would get here in 2024 so you could hear it. And if you think that's a small thing, you'll be small in your boldness. But rather, if you believe the absolute miracle it is that God opened your blind eyes, resurrected your spiritually lifeless pulse, you won't be able to help but proclaim the message. So to be bold missionally, we remember and we proclaim God's message to us, for us. And here's the thing about that. So now we're thinking about, what, okay, now that I actually am starting to proclaim the message, well, how does that, what goes down when that, when that happens? Well, I think oftentimes we get into a conversation, we get into a moment where it's an opportunity to share our faith and we just worry we don't have enough, enough knowledge, enough words, enough history with Jesus, perhaps. But let me tell you this. When you know your role in God saving others, guess what happens? You don't feel pressure for them to respond a certain way. When you know what your job is, guess what? Things get a lot easier because the burden's not on you to save. Your burden is to proclaim. You're free of the pressure and burden of saving others and it releases you of the fear of how they respond. Just because you didn't convince them, you didn't persuade them, doesn't mean you weren't faithful. That's on God 
In fact, Matthew chapter 13 is gonna encourage us how to proclaim the message. Jot down that reference, you can read it later, but I'll just summarize it like this. It's, here's our responsibility in proclaiming the message. Be bold and sling the seed. Be bold and sling the seed. Why is that important? Because there's four responses to the seed being planted and none of it has to do with the person who's actually throwing the seed. Okay, so the first response is the first seed is snatched, the word is heard and it's taken, it's snatched. So that's like some of you today, I'm talking and guess what? It's not just a positive impact or even a neutral impact to you. It's a very negative thing. Like you're hearing the word and you're gonna leave the church today. You're gonna go watch the US Open and you're gonna forget this all ever happened. And the Bible teaches that that's a response to hearing the word of God. So I'm not, I'm not burdened by that. I just know it's gonna happen. I expect it. Second, you'll see that some seeds, when they fall on ground, it's short-lived that it's planted in superficial, shallow soil. And when trouble or persecution arise, it falls away. So this is the person that like, all of a sudden you, you start sharing the gospel with them. You start sharing what Jesus is doing in their life, maybe in small group or something, and they, they start growing. But then all of a sudden life gets hard and you don't see him anymore. God says that's gonna happen. Third, the seed is stifled. By what? By two things, by the cares of the world and by the deceitfulness of riches. That there's gonna be people that you minister to, that you speak the gospel to, that you sling the seed toward, guess what? And you're in boldness, you're doing that. And they're gonna respond initially. And then all of a sudden, the 401k is more important. That's the glamour and the appeal of a life of earthly success is too much. And friends, at a very literal reading of, of Matthew 13, that's 75% of the time. So that's at best, honestly. But there is a fourth soil, and the Bible calls it the good soil. And here's what that seed does. It's fruitful. It yields supernatural fruit 30, 60, 100 fold. And that's what we're after. We just keep going because some of our good soil. And it's not my job to determine what the soil is. I'm just gonna go out there and start farming, scattering the seed, slinging it, believing that God can be at work in my proclamation of his message. So I do this in the bleachers while watching my kids' games. I do this in the carpool line with the attendant that I don't really wanna talk to, but I believe God has me there on purpose. I do this in class. I do this at the dinner table. I do this on break at work. We do this when we're taking out the trash and the neighbors down there are like, oh my gosh, I have to talk to them again. Yes, you do. You have the message of life and death. We proclaim the message and we get emboldened in our pursuit of the mission when we realize that their response isn't on us, it's on God. And when we recognize that, we're free to just sling the seed. We proclaim the message. That's how we're bold missionally. Third and finally, to be bold missionally, what do we do? We embrace God's calling. We embrace God's calling. I'm getting that from verse 20. Let me read it for you. For which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. What is he, the for which? What is that referencing? Well, the gospel. Paul is an ambassador for the gospel. He's in chains for the gospel. He's bold in his speech, why? For the gospel, his spiritual strength and missional boldness, it's rooted in him embracing his calling as an ambassador of Jesus Christ, wherever God would have him. He's like, hey, no matter where I go, no matter what I do, no matter what life brings me, guess what? I'm gonna be faithful to God because that's what I'm called to be. No matter where I am, no matter how hard it gets, I will be faithful. He's embraced his identity as an ambassador for the gospel. An ambassador isn't so different now from what it was then. This is a person who's loyal to a foreign nation. They're in a country, but they're loyal to another country. Their allegiance lies somewhere else. And that is every Christian because we are citizens of heaven, Philippians chapter three which means our allegiance, our loyalty is not to this nation. Primarily it is to that nation. We are citizens of heaven. We are allegiance to him, to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. 
In 2 Corinthians chapter five, it says that we are his ambassadors and God makes his appeal to the world through us. Yes, God could have put out in the sky, Jesus saves, and guess what? People still wouldn't believe. Could he have done that? Yes, but here's how God has chosen to carry his mission forward in the world. He's chosen ordinary people like you and me, ordinary ambassadors to make his appeal to the world about what he has done for us to save us from sin in Christ. He uses people. And no matter who you were before Christ, maybe you were an ambassador for a program, for a team, for a school. In Christ, here's who you are, an ambassador for Christ. It's an identity. It's the way you perceive your whole life. It's like a pair of glasses that you put on and it shifts your whole perception of the world. You're an ambassador for Christ. You're wearing the kingdom colors wherever you go. We're ambassadors for the gospel. We're also, we're not in chains for the gospel, but Paul was. And he's embracing this calling. He's literally asking for more words so he can do the thing that got him in prison to begin with. He's like, hey, I'm in prison writing this letter and give me the boldness so that I could continue being bold so that if I, if, I, if I stay in prison, so be it. He's embraced the suffering and the hardship that comes with following Jesus. And he says, so be it. He's worthy of it all. And this is just a blip on the eternity radar. And he knows that his circumstance shouldn't dictate whether or not he continues to speak on behalf of the king. He knows his job is to be faithful no matter the assignment that God gives him. He literally says, as I ought to speak. He knows that's his duty, but it's also his delight to speak for the king. You see, Paul believes that the worst thing that could happen to the believer is not death. It's not hardship. The worst thing that could happen to the believer, the worst thing that could happen for you and for me is that we would be timid on mission when he calls us to be bold. That we would waste the years that God gives us here on earth worrying and being stuck in our fear rather than being bold and saying, Jesus Christ rules and reigns now and forever. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. I don't wanna be ashamed. I don't wanna be timid of the gospel. I don't wanna waste my life. I wanna be bold on mission. And I won't be bold until I learn to embrace the calling God has given me, no matter how hard it is, no matter how difficult it might be. And in case you're here on a Sunday morning thinking to yourself, man, that's great for the Apostle Paul. Like I, he's got something I don't have. It's easy for you to say, Pastor Brandon, like that. That feels like something only the professional Christians do. I wanna share with you actually two spiritual giants that I know and love. One is with Jesus in heaven and the other is his big sister. His big sister was one of my students back in Chicago. And she lost her nine-year-old brother, John, to a brain tumor not so long ago. But I want you to hear as she shares a letter to how both he, John, and his sister embraced their calling no matter what. She writes, sweet Johnny, God did not promise me easy. He promised me good. And what a blessing it is to have loved you to the point of missing you so dearly. I spent the better part of your last two months sitting by your side, reading, studying, praying, laughing, and learning everything I could from you. At nine years old, you had no fear of death, no fear of the future, no fear of relationships. You had total and complete trust in God's goodness and purpose. You faced this battle with maturity I rarely see in those five times your elder. To say I'm proud, to say I was challenged, to say I've changed forever, all understatements. People often realize what is truly important at the end of their life and you maintained your values through it all. You did not waver in your faith and understood that above all else, your life was meant for the glory of Christ, whatever it cost. 
You unabashedly shared the gospel, but you lived your life in such a way that it shared it too. You spent your last few weeks on this earth serving people, sending gifts to your friends, making breakfast for your family, and giving all you had to make people feel loved. Like Jesus, in his final hours, John, you chose to wash feet rather than indulge. You spent what little energy you had blessing those around you. Thank you for being the best brother I could ask for both by blood and in Christ. I look forward to playing basketball with you in heaven. And I have peace knowing you're healed and in good company. I love you always, sweet Johnny. Much love, Bell. Ephesians 6 is challenging us through Paul's life and Ellie and John's story to do what we just sang we would do. That yes, I will choose to praise. I'll choose to magnify the Lord. No matter what hardship comes my way, no matter what circumstance, if it throws me in prison, if it means I lose a loved one, if it means that my life gets hard, guess what? I'm not gonna shut up about what God has done in Christ. I'll stay courageous, I'll stay bold, I'll be strong and I'll be relentless, why? Because God has taught me through his word that to be strong spiritually, to get there, I have to be bold on the mission. And if I embrace God's assignment for me, if I embrace his calling, guess what happens? I lean into it and I watch as his strength rushes to me in the moment of my heart, heartache. He is near to the brokenhearted. He saves the crushed in spirit. God is with you in your pain. And I know some of you are here today and you're carrying immense pain, immense hardship. And you think that God has lost sight of you, that he's abandoned you. But hear me, when Jesus says the great commission in Matthew chapter 28, here's what he says. He says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to deserve all I commanded you. And behold, what? I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Listen, Christian, God sees your hard work for him. He sees the labor. He sees the exhaustion you feel from pouring out again and again and again, another Sunday, another week, another time where you feel like you have nothing left to give. Hear me. God will strengthen you and he sees you. And you will stay bold if you embrace what God has given you in your calling. And the calling you're embracing might be a, di a diagnosis that might make you scared. It could be a job loss that intimidates you. Like, how are we gonna make ends meet? How am I gonna talk about Jesus right now when it's really hard in the sorrow? A family history that could have you on your heels when you're at the family party and not wanting to be on mission. It could be a call to go to a foreign nation and give up all of this to go somewhere else for him. It could be a call to a difficult small group we have nothing in common with any of them. That could all be your calling you have to embrace. But wherever you are is exactly where God wants you to be. Ephesians chapter two, verse 10. For we Christians are his workmanship, creating Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand. Which means the God of the universe sovereignly selected you to be their sister, to be their friend, to be their coworker, to be the agent of reconciliation in that place. Because you tell yourself things like this, if only Pastor Seth were here to talk to them about this. If only the guy on the stage I just heard this past Sunday was there to share his faith. He was really energetic about it. He was enthusiastic. Hear me, he doesn't want me there. He wants you there to do the work of the ministry. The good works he prepared beforehand, he sovereignly selected you to be the person there. And if you embrace your calling, guess what? It emboldens you. There's nobody else God has in mind to be in that room that day. God has you there. An ordinary person who God can do extraordinary things through for his mission. Because the same spirit that lives in every one of your spiritual heroes lives in you. To be bold on mission, we embrace God's calling, however hard it might be. Three quick things before I let you go. We learn to live here at Christ Church, not just learn to learn. So what do we learn? Three things. First, do I need boldness or do I need belief? Do I need boldness or do I need belief? If you don't believe in Jesus, I'm not asking you to go on a mission for him. 
Boldness is for the believer. Maybe the boldness you need is to cry out to him in faith to save you. Save me, save me, Jesus. I see it now. I see my sin. I see how I've turned away from you and I don't believe in you and why it's gotten me to the place I am. And then I need you to save me. I can't pay for my sins myself. Maybe that's what you believe in for the first time today. And if that's you, be so bold to cry out to him in faith to save you. If you hear his voice today, do not harden your hearts. Don't go backwards. Lean into him and cry out to him in faith. Run to Jesus. and He'll save. Second, where do you play scared? Where do you play scared? Where do you get in front of the putt and leave it short because you're scared and you're timid and you're overthinking it? I think in a room this size that there's maybe two categories here. I think you might play scared with other Christians or with the world. So maybe you play scared with the world where you're like, hey, I've insulated myself. I don't know many non-believers. I don't, I don't really do well with them. They, they watch shows I don't watch. They talk certain words that I don't wanna say or hear. Maybe you're playing scared. May I just encourage you to be bold in the mission? But maybe you're the flip side. Maybe you're like me, actually. And you actually get more intimidated by other Christians. Like, oh, I don't know as much as they know. I haven't been walking with Jesus as long as they have. How could I ever help them? How could I ever pray for them? How could I ever be any kind of encouragement whatsoever to them? How could I help make disciples? Don't, don't leave it short. Come join the mission. Come serve on a team here at Christ Church. If you have the spirit in you, God can use you. Christian, don't play scared. Because here's the third thing that I'm gonna ask you to do. Who am I boldly going to tell about Jesus this week? Who's it gonna be? And I wanna encourage you actually to go to the place where it takes spiritual courage, where it takes boldness. Who are you most afraid to tell Jesus about this week? Who is it in your life? Is it your coworker? Is it your barber? Is it your waiter? Is it your kid? Is it your spouse? Is it your mom? Is it your childhood buddy? Go be bold on the mission. And you can be bold when you request God's words, when you proclaim his message and you embrace the calling that God has given you.